Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this KPFA author event. I'm going to be your host this evening, and my name is Vilma V. And thank you. And on behalf of KPFA's general manager Q, Bob, the producer of this event, and all the staff and volunteers at 94.1 KPFA, I would like to thank you all for coming and your continuing support for listener-sponsored, community-powered radio. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a una noche muy especial con la maravillosa chicana Sandra Cisneros. No se preocupen, la entrevista va a estar en inglés, pero quería darle la bienvenida en nuestro idioma común. So bienvenidos a todos que hablan español y que son bilingüe, y son chicanas, latinos. Okay, but before we get started and I give our honored guest a proper introduction, let me get some just quick housekeeping stuff out of the way. Sandra Cisneros was born in Chicago in 1954 to a Mexican father and a Mexican-American mother. She has been writing all her life. And it was while attending the famous Iowa Writers Workshop that she began writing on the side, she wasn't part of her assignment, on the side, the work that she is perhaps most famous for, The House on Mango Street. She's also the author of Caramelo, Women Hollowing Creek, and other stories, a children's book called Hairs, Pelitos, and the poetry collection, My Wicked, Wicked Ways, Note the Two Wickeds, and many other, many other essays and written works. She has been the recipient of many awards for her writing, including a MacArthur Genius Grant, which she received 20 years ago in 1995. 95 for you young folks over there. But we're here to talk about her latest book, A House of My Own, Stories for My Life, where she writes in the intro that since she has no children of her own, she offers us these stories as she moves through her sixth decade of life and finds herself writing a new chapter in her own journey as a writer, a poet, artist, and social commentator. She no longer owns the bright purple house in San Antonio, Texas, but she has found a new home for herself in Mexico, specifically in San Miguel de Allende. She writes that with this book, quote, I wish to look backward and forward all at once before I transform myself finally into a pinwheel of light. The Library Journal says the memoir, A House of My Own, may be the best of the year thus far. They write, quote, it's a fierce portrait of an artist and her quest, and the roads taken and not taken to find a home of her own. All readers interested in creative writing, memoir, American literature, and Chicana literature will appreciate. Sandra herself said in an interview that, quote, it's important for women to create a spiritual house of their own so they can ask themselves, what do I want to do with my life as opposed to being told by a politician or the church? Sandra, yes. Sandra Cisneros has crafted a writer's life solely her own. She was the first to leave home in a family that consisted of six brothers, a lot of testosterone in the house. It was a scandalous move at the time. And an excerpt from one of her poems called His Story, she writes, quote, you see, an unlucky fate is mine to be born woman in a family of men. Six sons, my father groans, all home, and one female, gone. But she's here with us tonight, and we're lucky to hear to hear her tell us all about the stories of her life. Sandra has written fearlessly within intersections and borders about this, with the spaces between prose and poetry, the popular and the literary, English and Spanish, the US and Mexico, life and death, and from girl to womanhood. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm Bay Area welcome to Sandra Cisneros. Thank you. 
Mira no mas. That's all I can say. Um, thank you so much for coming here. It's just astonishing to see so many students, and I have friends and fellow writers here. How many of my Macondo writers are here? Ah, there they are. Okay. And uh, my, my fellow um, colleague and art, artist, uh, Esther Hernandez. Where are you, Esther? She had me in there. She's coming. It's the Mexican time. <laughs> She's coming with the um, famosísima Astrid Haddad, the performance artist who is pictured in my book, Nose to Nose. I think it's page 120. You can see the uh, wonderful Astrid Haddad. If you don't know her music, uh, Google her. She's a, a political a performance artist, a feminista, and a force of nature. Before I begin, can I take your picture? <laughs> this is for my Instagram account. Wave your hands. <laughs> Thank you. You can go on to official Sandra Cisneros and become a, a member. Okay. I've been documenting this book tour. This is week five of a seven-week book tour. Ya mero. And I, I put up an altar in uh, the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, if anyone lives near there. It'll be up till the end of the year. And it's uh, the fourth time I've installed this Day of the Dead altar for my mother. And installing it was the same process as writing the following uh, selection I'm going to read for you. First, you. Uh, put your antenna out there, then you meditate on the subject, then you collect all these things, then you edit them. And each time I put this altar up, this is the fourth time, as I said, uh, I keep revising and it becomes more and more perfect. So right now, if you see it in its fourth incarnation, uh, it's the most perfect that I can make it. And this is a chapter called An Ofrenda for My Mother. I want to read the uh, introduction as well. I was in the room the moment my mother died. She was in intensive care hooked up to machines that were keeping her alive. I was on a cot asleep in the same room when the nurse shook me and said, she's going. We'd been waiting for this moment for 48 hours and maybe all our lives, but it was still a surprise. It was dark out, November 1st, just before sunrise. There wasn't time to call anyone else except my brother Lolo, who had camped out in the hall. My mother's doctor had said she was brain dead, but the nurses in ICU talked to her gently as if she were still present, as did we. I'd been there when my friend Danny Lopez Lozano's spirit crossed. I was in the hospital room with him. I wasn't in the hospital room with him, but in my backyard after receiving the news. I was trying to meditate, but I didn't know how and was making a mess of it. My mind kept straying from Danny to whether I'd remembered to defrost the chicken. Then I was filled with guilt and tried again to think of Danny and only Danny. I mentioned this because I know I didn't bring on what happened next. The strangest thing. I felt a heat at the crown of my head as if someone had broken an egg and the yolk flowed down slow as honey, but warm as a fever. It wasn't just the heat that startled me, but the overwhelming emotion that came with it, a feeling of joy so intense, it made me cry. It moved through me vertically. By the time it entered my torso, moving to my feet, the top of my head was already cooling down. It scared me as it was happening. What is this, I thought. Then I realized it was Danny's spirit despidiéndose. I'll be seeing you. 
I'm fine. Don't be sad. Don't worry. Tell the others. And by the time I understood, my body went back to its normal temperature. He was gone. That's why in the ICU room with my mother, I was ready like a baseball player waiting for a fly ball. My mother was a force of nature, so I was expecting a tsunami. Instead, I almost didn't notice the hovering emotion that moved about the room like moonlight shimmering on water. It was gentle and tender and sweet, sweet, sweet. Not like my mother at all. <laughs> and it didn't travel through me from crown to feet. It was as soft as a mouth and barely perceptible like a moth fluttering just beyond reach. Do you feel that? I asked Lolo, but he just frowned. Grab her hands. Tell her she can go, I said. I was excited the way I imagine you're excited when you're witnessing a birth. You can't believe it's happening. I felt like that, as if I were in a sacred room, lucky to help her die, just as she had helped me to be born. You have no idea, I said to mother, no idea what you did in this life. It cracked my heart in two to think this pure love was my mother all along, underneath all that bravado, under the thunder and rage. How had she gone from that to the woman I knew. Then the shimmering dimmed, then faded, and we were left alone. I became a writer thanks to a mother who was unhappy being a mother. She was a prisoner of war mother banging on the bars of her cell all her life. Unhappy women do this. She searched for escape routes from her prison and found them in museums, the park, and the public library. As a child, she lived in the parish of St. Francis of Assisi in Chicago, off Roosevelt Road and South Halsted Street, close enough to downtown she could walk there. I have a photo of her as a very young girl on the steps of a Chicago museum with her best friend, Francis. I know my mother often ran off all day with her friends and paid her younger sisters to do her chores. She did not know what awaited her in her life, and if she had, she might have run farther than the museum. <laughs> because my mother needed to fortify her spirit, Saturdays were reserved for the library, Sundays for the concerts in Grant Park, or visits to the many Chicago museums. I used to think this was for our sake, but now I realize it was for hers. She loved opera, Pearl Buck novels, and the movie based on A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Later, she would ditch Pearl Buck for Noam Chomsky. <laughs> but in the beginning, she read fiction. I know she dreamt of becoming some sort of artist. She could sing and draw, but I'm sure she never dreamt of mothering seven kids. I think she married my father because he rescued her from a house with peeling paint and beds crowded with sisters and bed bugs. At least, this is what my father reminded her when they argued. He came from Mexico City and spoke an impeccable Spanish as stiff and formal as the beautiful suits he wore. He was a gentleman, and I imagine my mother saw him as cosmopolitan and sophisticated. She did not know he was a dreamer and would give her seven kids and an unimaginative life. My mother was the beauty of the family, used to being spoiled by her eldest sister. If there was one thing my father knew how to do, it was how to spoil a woman. He believed women want words more than anything, 
and he had a lot of them. Mi cielo, mi vida, mi amor. So for a little while, she must have been happy. I have a photo of them dancing and kissing. It's obvious they're in love. But it didn't last very long and was replaced with a more durable daily love. And the words were replaced with more durable daily words too. Vieja. Donde estás? Where's my old lady? No me llames vieja. Yo no soy vieja. Don't call me old lady. I'm not old. Sundays, father chauffeured us wherever mother directed. A classical concert in the park while he snored on a blanket under a tree. The Brookfield Zoo or Grant Park Museum. I'll wait here, father would say and slide onto a bench. He would have preferred to stay home reading his Mexican magazines in bed or soaking his feet after a week of bobbing like a prize fighter around the sofas and chairs he upholstered. But mother complained she had to get out of that house or go crazy. On Saturdays, I walked with mother to the library. For me, the library was a wonderful house, a house of ideas, a house of silence. Our own house was like that of the cooks in Alice in Wonderland. A lot of shouting and shattering of dishes. Would someone hand me a baby? And would the baby turn into a pig? Anything could happen in this kitchen. It was a nightmare, and I was condemned to the lowest job of scullery maid because I was too daydreamy to learn how to cook. The rice burned on me, an expensive mistake. So I was ordered to cut potatoes into little squares or scrub pans or set the table, anything else mother thought of while she was busy banging pots and yelling. Hell was a kitchen. Hell was having to go to the supermarket every Friday with her. Sometimes father drove us, usually we walk there and back with a collapsible shopping cart and a red wagon. It was a cross buying groceries for our army. Neither mother nor I enjoyed it. Sometimes my father and mother went to the Randolph Street Market to buy eggs and vegetables wholesale for the nine of us. Sometimes my mother walked down North Avenue beyond Humble Park to the day old bakery to buy us sweet bread. On Sundays, after scavenging the flea market at Maxwell Street, we stopped for Mexican groceries on 18th Street. Carnitas and chicharron served on hot tortillas with dollops of sour cream and sprigs of cilantro. These Sunday dinners were one of the few times father cooked. He stood over the cutting board and chopped like a Japanese chef humming while he worked until the carnitas were diced to his liking. Father was meticulous. He liked to remind everyone he was from a good family, the son of a Mexican military man and the grandson of a pianist who was also an educator. But father's appreciation of the finer things in life did not extend beyond nightclubs. He loved dance halls and cabarets, the big bands of Xavier Cugart, Perez Prado, and Benny Goodman, the sultry voice of Peggy Lee singing Lil Green's Why Don't You Do Right, whose lyrics, get out of here and get me some money too, always made him laugh. He was a good dancer and a sharp dresser. And then he got married. Like everybody we knew, we took road trips from Chicago to Mexico to visit family. In Mexico, we didn't have to ask father to drive us to museums. The past and the present were all around us. We witnessed paper Judases exploding on Holy Week, saw Aztec pyramids sprouting in the middle of downtown, watched dancers swing like birds from a giant pole planted in front of the cathedral, listened to ancient music played on drums and conch shells in the central plaza. 
Art was in the paper flags fluttering above us at a fiesta, in the mangoes sliced like roses and served on a stick, in the cheap trinkets we bought with our Sunday allowance at the market, in the pastel wafer candies studded with pumpkin seeds. Art was a way of being. On these vacations, Father caught up on his reading. His library consisted of Mexican comic books and pocket-sized fotonovelas printed in a dark chocolate ink on paper so cheap it was used as toilet paper by the poor. When Father was done with his little books, he turned them over to me and I painted over the ladies' chocolate-tinted mouths with a lead pencil dipped in spit. This is how I learned to read in Spanish. Father also had a private library, a secret stash of Alarma magazines whose covers were so savage, mother forced him to keep them under the mattress in brown paper bags. <laughs> Alarma featured sensational stories about everyday Mexican events. Yet another bus drives off a cliff. Yet another quake swallows a village. Yet another machete murder, all with detailed photos. Mexicans love staring at death. I wasn't allowed to read these magazines, but once in a while, I did catch a headline when father was reading in bed. Wife kills husband and serves his head in tacos. <laughs> I did not make that up. Back in Chicago, mother painted geishas and paint by number sets in the kitchen after her housework was done. She made fake flowers with crepe paper until she grew flowers from seeds she sent away for. She sewed stuffed toys and doll clothes, designed theater sets, and created puppets but it wasn't enough. Mother felt duped by life and sighed for the life that wasn't hers. Father watched television in bed, content, chuckling, calling out for pancakes. There's no intelligent life around here, Mother said out loud to no one in particular. When she was in a bad mood, which was often, she threw sharp words like knives, wounding and maiming the guilty and the innocent. Your mother, father complained to me near tears. Sick and tired, miserable, mother raged and paced her cell. We tiptoed around her, feeling gloomy and guilty. I understood father. He understood me. Neither of us understood her, and she never understood us. But that didn't matter. A stack of pancakes, a paycheck, a bouquet of dandelions, a ride to the Garfield Park Conservatory, a box of popcorn from the Sears, a language for the words we couldn't say. Um, I know a lot of you want to ask me about my firstborn, uh, that good child who works so hard and pays for my upkeep. And I don't mind talking about my firstborn, so I, but I realized I had never documented uh, the night that I finished House on Mongo Street. Uh, so I did hear, uh, for my reader's sake, in the first um, selection of the book, and it's called Idra House. I'm only going to read one little part of it because it's a long essay about finishing the book in an island in Greece. The only thing you need to know is that I mention uh, a, a woman at the end named, oh, I forget what I named her in real life. She had a different name. What do I name her in the book? I tried to, I named her Liesel. 
She was this uh, German woman who was like 20 years older than me when I was living there. I, was, I, I befriended a woman 20 years older and a woman 10 years younger, and I talk about that in the essay. So when Liesel's name comes up, you'll know she's this uh, uh, woman who lives on the island who gave me the idea of living in a house of my own with no children, no husband, just a beautiful house to create in. And, um, okay, and I'm just going to read the last part. The island's name was Idra, but by the time I lived there, there was no water. It was just a name from uh, hundreds of years prior when the island used to have springs. It's an island that's um, about two hours from the port of Piraeus, so it's not that far from Athens. Maybe faster if you get on the little hydrofoils. They're those little kind of boats that look like dragonflies, and they float on the water, and they go zoom. And so uh, that's, that's where I lived when I finished the book. The Idra house and the house on Mango Street are united together in that voyage. An eternal moment like being in love. I try from this distance to remember where I wrote each of the vignettes from house, but I can only place a few, and as I had no computer then, and no place to store my drafts as a voyager, must rely on memory. The night I began the book in Iowa, I wrote the first chapter, the house on Mango Street, Memo Ortiz, and a vignette that fell by the wayside. When I was working as a high school teacher in Chicago, I wrote Darius and the Clouds, Chanclas, Minerva Wright's poems, Geraldo No Last Name, and The Monkey Garden. The family of Little Feet was born during the year I was a counselor at Loyola University, my alma mater, after a comment a student made about my own small feet. Alicia, who sees mice, and what Sally said were also based on something spoken by one of my consulees. During the same time in my life, I shared the first job with the Chicago writer James McManus. Jim took my work seriously and reminded me to do the same, and this was just what I needed to hear at that time of wobbling faith in my own creative powers. I finished several vignettes while in Provincetown. Which ones? I can't be sure, but I remember starting and finishing Elenita Card's palm water on that round oak table next to the window that caught the feet of the upstairs tenants stomping up and down the stairs. One morning in Athens, just before waking, I dreamt the first line of the three sisters. They came with the wind that blows in August, thin as a spider web and barely noticed. Maybe being in Greece made me think in threes. I was a big fan of Robert Graves' The White Goddess. I tucked that sentence in my journal and ferried it to Idra, where I wrote the vignette. One night, with only my flashlight on the moon illuminating the way, I climbed the steps to my Idra house. I was wrestling with whether to write a story of a violation. I felt protective of my protagonist. I didn't want any harm to come to her. There was also the difficulty of how to write a story the character didn't want to tell. And how would I write it if I had no first-hand experience either as victim or witness? But then I remembered something that had happened to me in the eighth grade, how a wild boy had grabbed my face against my will and kissed me one night when I was walking home on North Avenue with a girlfriend how my friend, wiser to the world, had walked off the curb of the street and left me behind alone when this boy and his buddy approached. The two were possibly no older than we were, but there was something about their swagger that warned her, uh-oh, trouble. I was the one there for the taking. He lunged. I moved my face, but not fast enough and his mouth landed awkwardly on one eye. <laughs> it was my first kiss. <laughs> he said, I love you, Spanish girl. Then they galumped off roaring, mightily pleased with themselves. Did he hurt you? I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Pretending it was nothing, but I wasn't okay. I couldn't talk about it in words, not even to myself. 
how my body spoke about it for years, how I told no one and tried to forget it, but trying to forget only made it bob up to the surface like a drowned lady in that swampland called dreams. On the island, I was on the same writing schedule as I am today, midday till sunset. Then I would slip on my leather sandals and fly with the winged feet of Hermes down the 350 stone steps to civilization. It was, in a way, an ideal life, a cloistered convent in the day and the pirate bar at night, the eccentric population of the island within reach when I needed their company. Was I sharing what I was writing with anyone during those those months, did I show anything to Iphigenia, who was also a writer? I don't remember. I typed in the afternoon and sometimes typed through the night. Although I didn't write the vignettes in linear order or arrange them in a fixed order as I wrote them, and though I told my publisher to suggest an arrangement, I knew intuitively how they were supposed to line up. Two months later, when I was lodged in the south of France, I would send instructions to my publisher and make that specific sequence clear. I know that this is true because I just found my notebook with the sequence. Uh, it's in the archives now at uh, Southwest Texas State in San Marcos. Toward the end of November, terrible storms with their wild Medusa hair of lightning arrived, sometimes canceling the boats that came and went. I moved my office indoors, but eventually was forced to finish my last week on Idra down at the port at Vasili's house because my house had no heat and, as it was made entirely of stone, was as damp and cold as a mausoleum. Vasili's liked for me and Will to stay at his place when he was away. I think he thought it enhanced his reputation to have two young girls, one dark, one fair, coming in and out. I'm reminded here of something Carlos Fuentes said, how Don Juan doesn't realize when he's turned into Don Quixote. <laughs> As I write this, a memory I'd forgotten bubbles to the surface. Vasilis and I are seated on his couch one evening. He lunges forward, his face of a sad prisoner hovering toward me. He's pushing me on my back, trying to kiss me but I spring up like a punching clown and laugh so hard he never tries it again. The night I finished house, I was staying at Vasily's second floor apartment. It was on a narrow alley beyond the bakery with no view of the sea, but a, a lovely view of the town and the night sky. I seem to remember the apartment was heated with steam, but this might just be my memory. It was snug and cozy, decorated in the eastern way with carpets everywhere. Vasilis had gone to Athens, and I had with me that night a tall Greek boy whom I did not love with dark raccoon rings under his eyes. I spent my last days on the island with him. I can't remember why. Men were nuisances when I was writing. They demanded you come to bed at once. They had urgent hungers. But once you fed them, like children, they fell asleep. <laughs> then I'd get back to my writing. I was saving a record from Vasily's collection for the moment when I finished the book, Strauss's Blue Danube. I opened the windows and pushed the heavy wooden shutters apart, even though it was crisp outdoors. They parted with a creak, and the moon stepped in. It was a clear evening filled with stars. The full moon wasn't expected until the next night, but that evening the night was ablaze, the moonlight washing the white town blue. The first notes of the blue Danube began, gently, timidly at first. The sky was overwhelmed with strange clouds that night, I remember. I watched them stretch and yawn with the opening notes, and as the music gradually gained momentum, they grew more animated. In the end, they finished hurtling past as swift as a school of fish darting through that sea called the sky. When the waltz ended, 
I got my Walkman and ran through the blue town to the sea with Astor Piazzolla and Jerry Mulligan in my ears. When I got to the walkway between Idra and Caminha, I climbed up on the wall and began to dance, feeling every bit the sorceress. I finished, I shouted, and could see the fishing boats going out for calamari because calamari is fished only at night. It's bad luck to see a woman when one is fishing, Constantinos told me. And I wondered if the soldiers if the sailors could see me dancing on the wall like a witch, cursing because they wouldn't catch any calamari that night. <laughs> then I remembered Liesel, and I went to say goodbye. Liesel was always awake at night, so I wasn't afraid to call on her at that hour. Years later, Liesel would tell me we danced under the moon that night, though I don't remember. It was all brief and hurried. I had to pack and catch the first morning hydrofoil, and it was, it was almost dawn when I knocked on Liesel's door. At daybreak, I kissed the raccoon boy goodbye, deposited the house keys, and got on the hydrofoil to Athens, where I mailed the manuscript off from the Syntagma Square post office without making a copy. This seems incredibly reckless to me now in the age of computers, but that's what my life was like, B.C., before computers. <laughs> A decade later, when I returned to Idra, I thought I remembered the island perfectly, but when I stepped off the boat, I was aware there was one thing I'd forgotten the cool breath that rises from the damp stone, even in the summer. Every now and then, the sound of a rooster crowing or the mournful cry of a donkey takes me back to my island. Why do I call it my, I wonder? Some part of it was given to me for keeps, I believe. Writing today from this distance, it's as if I always lived in that house with windows looking out to the garden and sea. I thought I was Penelope during my Greek days, but now I realize I was Odysseus. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. As in Kavafi's poem, I'm grateful for the marvelous journey. Thank you, Shikstaki. I, I think we should do the second section, because I can't, re I, I brought a clock, but I forgot to look at it when I came out. So we'll just do the interview. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Let's see if I got this. Yes. Because um, I want to continue to talk about this theme of the house. Yeah, I think I am. It's a little high. I have to just sit very straight back, it seems like. I can't slouch there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about we have a lot of high school students here, and it seems like such a seminal book that still widely taught in middle school and high schools. But let, let me ask you a little bit, is it a, is it a young adult book? And is it a children's book? Do you see it as that kind of book? No. No. I never wrote it for children. I never wrote it for anyone but very sophisticated uh, high school dropouts who were anywhere from <laughs> 15 to 22. Yeah. Not for children. I mean, children can read it, but it's not for them. You know, they, they won't get it, you know. There's a lot about, you know, there's so much about uh, sexuality in the book and uh, spirituality. So, and it's, uh, I, I think it'll go over their heads. I wrote it in such a way so they could read it. They could be in the room, but I didn't expect, you know. And what, what becomes of some of the girls in the book? You know, the Sally, Ruthie, Minerva. Can you talk a little bit about some of those characters? Um, you mentioned in your little talk 
the story Red Clowns about the woman at the at the um, carnival. So tell talk to us a little bit about those characters, about those women. Oh, you know, uh, those were my students, uh, and uh, I talk a little bit about that in the uh, 25th anniversary introduction, which is reprinted in in House of My Own. Uh, they their lives. You know, I started with a real place that was my uh, own memory and my own shame, because I think. The best writing comes from the things we are afraid to think about or talk about. I always tell my young writers, don't write about what you remember, write about what you wish you could forget. You know, to go to those places that are uncomfortable for you to write or speak. Because, you know, I, you know, I just came back from Long Beach and women were coming up to me crying about something that happened to them in third grade. And I said, you know, you're 20-something you're now, and you're still crying. You haven't told this story. You need to transform that pain to light. I've had stories that I didn't speak about for 30 years, and I, I couldn't think about them without, you know, especially the, the memory of that little boy who, who grabbed me. It was like a violation in the street. And, you know, I never told anyone that. It's the first time I've written it down is in this book. Uh, and it doesn't have power in, over me because I think those memories hold a knife to our throats. We have to tell those stories for the real reasons why we need to tell stories, not to get published or get famous and not to, uh, to satisfy our ego. We need to tell stories because we're haunted. You know, our heart has all these ghosts in there and if you don't talk about these things, they have power over you. If you tell them, even just to yourself on a little piece of paper, you could tear it up afterwards, you could burn it, you could eat it, but you have to get it out. You know, sometimes it's not like enough to write it one time, you have to do a whole series, or it's a whole book of poems, a whole like collection. But until you can feel that you're taking the knife away from that story, so it doesn't make you cry anymore, it doesn't make you ashamed, it doesn't make you angry. That's the wonderful thing about writing, you start right where you are, and you just keep writing until you compost all this junk, and coffee grounds and, you know, banana peels. And then out of that, when you get to a little flower, you're done. That's how you know you're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like meditating, you know? It's just like meditating. Uh, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a sitting meditation. And you start exactly where you are. It's just like meditating. You, you accept where you are and you know it's going to take you to a better place. You know, uh, a lot of times young writers, you know, rant or put things out there when that's not done. And they need to just keep writing until they get past the anger to some illumination, to some wiser place, some more generous and compassionate place. That's, that's why we need to write. Everybody needs to write. Everybody doesn't need to be an author, but everyone needs to write or make art or sing or something to transform those demons. Yeah, that you know? creative self. Yeah. 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 Mm. You mentioned this in the talk too. You have the tenth, tenth uh, anniversary intro to and House of Mango, and then the twentieth fifth anniversary. Yeah. So, what does that book mean to you now that it's been? What is it? Oh, um, you know, like I, I see it as um, you know, everybody loves my firstborn, but uh, <laughs> you know, I love all my children, but my favorite is always the one I'm writing. You know, I'm always more concerned about the one that's in the horizon. Um, I love Caramelo best because I think it's my best writing, you know. I think it's more sophisticated. And, you know, I, you know, I, I told myself when I wrote that book, hey, I had enough prizes that I don't need any more. And then it kind of got ignored, and I thought, hmm. hmm. But it, it won the Dublin uh, Impact. It made the shortlist for the Dublin Impact Prize, which is uh, writers select that. So I felt happy that it, it competed on a global level and got some attention. And, you know, it got attention in the United Kingdom. It didn't, not much in the United States, but, you know, it, it's newer book than House on Mongo Street. You know, it, it needs to be out there uh, a couple of decades more. I might not see its success in my lifetime, but I, I, I really believe in that book. Well, maybe after today, more people will take a look at some of the other books. Uh, I that think you've the written. size uh, asusta. It terrifies people. <laughs> <laughs> and also, staying on the theme of the House on Mango Street, one of the last essays is called A House of My Own. The last so, vignette, yeah. Yeah, the little vignette. So there, this theme of having your own house has run through, it seems like, your whole literary life. You know, um, you know it's like um, when you write, it's like what you dream. You don't know what you're going to dream. 
You know, you don't say, well, tonight I'll dream about a house. You just dream. <laughs> and to, the same with writing. I don't know what I'm going to write about till after I've written it. So I, I didn't uh, know, I had no idea that this book had house as theme. It was something that was brought to my attention, and my editor pointed out this thread. So I let some of the other uh, selections go. Mm. I had some selections that were based on uh, loves or you know, mentors, and that's going to be in another collection. So I pulled those away. They, some of them uh, fell on the wayside and stopped, and I have to go back and rework them for future collections. So th I have in my head an idea of, of uh, writing about the loves in my life and the uh, mentors. Uh, which, by the way, we're not the same. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I see the, the loves as being the exploding cigars and the uh, mentors as being these North Stars, so that's a tentative title. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this idea of finding also a, a your own, as a woman, your own spiritual house, how, how do you do that with some of the challenges of relationships and maybe having children? How, how what advice do you have for women trying to maintain their creative muse, but still maybe do want to have a boyfriend or have some children? Well, I don't know. I never had a boyfriend that lasted very long, so I can't tell you. You know, I'm, I always chose the, the, the bad boys, and I, I always chose the ones that were far away. Maybe I did that unconsciously so they wouldn't be in the way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I always had these imaginary loves in other countries or other cities. You know, I, I think I did that because I, I needed that space of my own. And, uh, you know, I have no regrets. Uh, I chose and, you know, uh, what I needed at the time, and I'm filled with gratitude. Uh, even the pain was necessary. It allowed me to uh, write. And uh, I, I just feel a great sense of gratitude at 60 for, you know how like that uh, Willie Nelson, for all the girls I ever loved, you know, I feel like that about the, all the guys, you know, that came in my life. I'm really glad they left, you know, I'm really happy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I see, you know, I, I, that's just me, but that's not other people. I can't tell you. I like my company, my own company. I like being alone and, uh, you know, I like going to bed with a book. You know, I don't need to have somebody anymore. You know, I feel the, a lot of love at this point in my life, and you know, I, I just feel happy, happiest in my own company. You know, when there's people in my life, I tend to uh, hemorrhage and give all this love to that person, and uh, I don't. It's almost like I ignore myself and get lost. So I'm, I'm very happy at this time in my life. I get the love from trees and clouds and dogs, and people that I know who make me laugh, and it's just the happiest time in my life, yeah. Great, man. I say that, honestly. You know, I, I don't know uh, how it is for other women, but I really feel like I wasted a lot of time with novios, you know? I, I could have learned Urdu or something, you know? <laughs> I could have, like, belly danced or something, it, you know, useful. And I just wasted a lot of time with novios that really, you know, they took me to interesting places in my life, you know, I must say. And I certainly would never tell women not to have novios. I would encourage them to have many, you know, many more. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think we're like too inhibited. We live in such a conservative time. I'm so glad I'm not 20, you know. It is. It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. One of the uh, chapters that I love um, in the book is called, I Can Live Sola, and I Love to Work. Yeah, but I, I didn't believe that in the beginning. You right. know, I used to cry every month. You know, uh, all through my 20s, I had cut out a Mary Cassatt calendar, and I put it, the little quote on my refrigerator, and I would cry every month like a tsunami. Mm. I just thought it was normal. I thought everybody cried every month like mm -hmm. that, you know? <laughs> I was just so terrified, and I didn't really like working, and I didn't like living alone. And uh, you know, when I didn't have anyone to go out with or no one to distract me, that's when I would write. So uh, now I like living uh, alone, and uh, uh, and I like working. Actually, I like having worked. 
you know, to have to go to work is, uh, is kind of like going to the gym, you know, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you feel so good afterwards. Yeah, you don't afterwards. want to go there. Oh, yeah, you know, I, but this world is, is geared towards, um, there's two different kinds of people in the world. There's the roosters, the gallos, and the tecolotes, the owls. And all of the world is, is, especially in the United States and in Mexico, is geared towards the roosters. You know, in planes all leave early and uh, the banks are open for the roosters. Yes. But like, you know, what if you want to go out at midnight? You know, you have to move to Buenos Aires, <laughs> right? Um, yes. That's yes. the problem. I always call my California friends because uh, they're a couple of hours. I'm on central time and they're a couple hours later. And I'm always like, uh, you know, why couldn't there be like a nightclub that opens at midnight and piano bar or something, you know, for like writers to go and talk about like what they wrote that day, you know, something like that. I, I had that and I lived in Greece. You know, I could come down from my house and it was perfectly safe. Uh, and walk down and go to talk to people and then walk up at two o'clock in the morning under the light of the moon. It's a beautiful existence. And it was totally, you know, just in, uh, it totally never found, I never found it again, that mm. kind of life. Mm. Yeah, it's, it sounds so freeing and independent and yeah. actualized. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, didn't believe that there could, I could live like that. Maybe, maybe I, I fool myself and thought it was safe, but that's how I lived during the time that I was finishing the book. Excellent. So let's, let me talk to you. I'd, I'd love to hear more about you as a young girl, because um, with the current success you have, you can imagine, or I would imagine, that you were, you know, wrote essays really easy, got A's in English in all your classes, but it turns out in a chapter in the book called A, a Girl Called Daydreamer, that you weren't the best student, actually. Well, I think I was the best student. It's just the teacher didn't know that. <laughs> you know? You know? But, you know, how many, how many best students, how many potential writers are out there, but they're in a class with 44 students? And maybe their talent is doing cartoons, or maybe their talent is drawing, and, and there's no, there's no class for art or no grade for books read out of class. You know, I had a library card before I knew how to hold a pen. And I read many books, but there was no place in that report card. There's a photo of that report card, by the way, in my book. It's a lot I of have, C's and, and D's. C's and D's, one B minus for behavior. <laughs> I was afraid to raise my hand, you know, and there was 44 people in that class. I missed class a lot. I remember asking my mother if I could stay home several times, mental health days. And my mother, for some reason, she let me stay home. And uh, you know, I just remember being in that class and never knowing where we were when the teacher called me because she, well, for one thing, she had two, two grades, 44 students, half split. You know how those schools are when they're all crowded? and they have to teach, like, it's kind of like those, that guy who used to come out in the Ed Sullivan show and he had to spin those plates on the stick, remember them? <laughs> yes. He'd get 12 going and then he'd have to run and get that one started. It was like that, that's how she taught. And so of course by the time, you know, she got all of these plates spinning, you know, I was looking out the window. Or, so anyway, I think it, uh, a miracle happened in my life and that is when I was in that class uh, that winter, uh, the pipes froze, and we lived in a big brownstone uh, that was uh, destined to be demolished for urban renewal. And fortunately, force of nature came, the pipes froze, and landlord wasn't going to fix them because the building was going to be knocked down. And so we had to move. That move took me out of that school with the 44 students, it put me in another neighborhood, in the Puerto Rican neighborhood of Humble Park, and uh, we had sisters, uh, they were the sisters of they were something, I can't remember their name, but they should have been called the Sisters of Compassionate Care and Generosity, <laughs> something like that. Because they were like so kind, and the lay teachers that worked there were so kind. Mm. And that's where uh, I, I first had a teacher for the first time in my life, and I'd been in school for like six years, uh, pull the paper from my page and say, this is beautiful, and put it in the front of the class and show everybody in the classroom something that I did that was good. I was not used to positive reinforcement. So if I hadn't, uh, if the pipes hadn't frozen, mm. I, I wouldn't be here. 
<laughs> it's really the truth. Imagine. It's really the truth. So imagine how many kids are out there and they're just in a class where the teacher is overwhelmed and she can't notice and you know she has no idea and they have no idea that they have any potential. Yeah, and, and the art of daydreaming is often, you know, like they want you to snap back and face attention and, and you talk about how daydreaming is another word for a thinker, a visionary. Yeah, yeah. tell us a little bit well, about that. Well, you know, my mother uh, got called to school uh, and a uh, sister told me, uh, tell your mother to come to school, I want to talk to her. I was like, oh, you know. I never raised my hand. I, I had learned this mentality of like, don't make eye contact, don't raise your hand, and just get through. Uh, so I made my, my mother, I took the note home, I told my mother, Busted. Oh, sister wants to see you. What did you do? Oh, I don't know. So my mother went, and uh, she was really upset because you know she had to cook. She had all, all these people that were waiting on her. I had to go with her, and I, I don't remember being in the room. I think I was waiting outside when she came out. She was really mad, and I was like, you know, what did sister say? She said, "You're a daydreamer." I was like, "Oh, daydreamer." And so you get this idea that daydreaming or dreaming is not a good thing. You know, and my mother scolded me. She, the dinner was going to be late. Everything was ruined. It was my fault. So it was good we got out of that. You know, I just thank those frozen pipes. You know, they're, they're just, I don't know what would have happened if those pipes hadn't frozen and I, if I'd stayed at that school. You know, I thought also because um, it's how you think the teacher sees you. And in this new school, because the teacher was so kind and had plucked my page, my drawing, and put it up, for example, the class, I thought that I should try a little more for her. Mm. You know, I started raising my hand. I tried mm. harder. I thought maybe she was confused because I used to have these little blue glasses from the Sears. I thought she confused those for me being smart. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so also you spoke earlier about your mother and your relationship with your mom. Yeah. And um, you said that you understood your father, but you never quite understood your mother. But now that she has, I believe she's passed in 2007, so it's been a few years. Um, have, you, have your understanding of your mother changed now? Well, you know, being in that, as I said in that introduction, being in that room when she crossed and having that experience of feeling her spirit leave, I, I just... It just was phenomenally uh, big news to me that this was who my, the real mother was underneath all of these layers. The woman I met was not the person she had been. If I hadn't been in that room, I maybe wouldn't have been able to write that essay or create the altar the way I did. Wow. It caused me to have a lot of compassion and uh, uh, sadness for her life. And it made me understand my mother, and it made me forgive my mother and ask for forgiveness. You know, a lot of times we have to work those things out uh, after someone dies, and it takes a long time. But for me, just being in that room that day, November 1st, 2007, it, it just, I got it. I figured it out, and, you know, it saved me years of meditation. Yeah, it's an amazing gift. Yeah. And so then let's talk a little bit about then your grandmother, her relationship with her mother, which you, you mentioned a footnote that yeah. also you thought there might have been a disconnect in what your my mother mom, understood. My mom didn't ad, uh, admire her mother, and she only talked about her in very brief, clipped phrases, and they were not uh, wonderful. She would say, oh, she was weak. That's what she would say, and just dismiss her with that. And so I grew up thinking she was weak, and then, you know, when I started... Uh, figuring out things about my grandmother, things, little strands that came to me, things I figured. I never knew my grandmother. She died when I was like five. But uh, are you, you start figuring things out as an adult. You know, here's a woman that crossed over during the violence of the Mexican Revolution, maybe had to walk, uh, rode a train, had two little ones when she made this trek, had one in her pancita who was born in El Paso, had to live in tents, had to make food while they're voyaging and living in tents until the years that they make it, and had, loses children. Children are born, children are, die as babies and as adults. Mm. And that to me doesn't sound like a weak woman. You know, that my mother had a completely, uh, 
skewed vision. But I also know that my mother, her definition of a strong woman was very different from what I would define. And I think that a woman que sabe aguantar, that knows how to endure, even though she doesn't say anything, has to be a very strong woman. And I think that she had to make her life the way she had to make it, considering uh, the times. So I look at her in a different light. I, I, I write about her in the footnote. Yeah. 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 I also try to include the names of my ancestors in this book, uh, especially the women. So many of the women in our families, we don't know their names. If I ask you, what's your grandmother's name? You might give me her first name. You don't know her last name. You know, so they get lost. In one generation, we don't know the women in our lives, the grandmothers, the great-grandmothers. We don't know their names. And to me, that seemed awful. So I tried to put their names in this book, photographs of them, and place their names. These were women who didn't know how to read or write, and they're my literary antecedents. I wanted to honor them and include them in this book. Yeah. Yeah, and it's easy to judge from a place, a modern place, and not realize where people are coming from and the challenges they face. It's so, it's so easy to dismiss that and not be aware of it because you yeah. kind of need an imagination and a, to, to place yourself there. Yeah, and you know, they're, they're part of who made me who I am. Uh, I feel as if, even though I didn't know my grandmother, I'm getting to know her now, uh, now that she's and I are like, you know, communicating in a different way, perhaps in dreams. Uh, things that she might have taught me. You know, she knew certain things that were very indigenous in origin. For example, she never woke her children uh, by shouting or, you know, waking them uh, abruptly. She called them gently. And my mother said she did this to allow time for her children to fly back into their bodies. That's sweet. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. That's an indigenous belief that you do this kind of astral projection and travel. And to me, that's not like a, that's an amazing woman. I would have liked to have learned from her. So I feel, uh, I just feel just invoking her or putting her in the book or naming her or writing her name on the wall and the altar is a way to honor her. Her uh, souvenir scarf for the Virgen de Guadalupe is in the altar and also her mother's embroidery is in the altar and my mother's embroidery. So I included uh, three generations of, uh, besides myself, four if you count myself in the altar. And that altar is in Long Beach. People can actually go see that now, right? Yeah, it's there till the end of the year. That's I think beautiful. they'll bring it down in January and then it'll go back to the place where it started. It, went, it started at the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. It went to the Hispanic Culture Center in Albuquerque. It went to the Smithsonian in the same uh, history museum where ruby red slippers are. And yeah, it's like amazing. And now it's here in California uh, before I'm gonna uh, disassemble it and donate it to the permanent collection at the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. That's great. Mm -hmm. So then let's talk about your dad. And he was an upholsterer. Yeah. And I love that he had a business card uh, that you've mimicked with your writers. Can you tell us a little bit well, about my, that? My father had this uh, business card um, that said, uh, uh, Cisneros Upholstery, custom quality work, over 50 years experience. And I'd say, well, you know, it's not exactly 50 years. He said, so what, you know? <laughs> my father liked to exaggerate, you know? Eh, más o menos, one day it'll be 50, so, you know. Uh, so I always thought, I'd love to have a card that says, Sandra Cisneros, writer, custom quality work, over 30 years experience, or whatever. I wasn't going to lie like my father. I was going to be accurate. And so one day, I did that. I made a little card, and it says, you know, I, I, I don't know if I have any left, but I, I showed my father. And I said, you know, look, I did this just like you. And it made him laugh. He's, he, he was amused and enjoyed it. <laughs> And then what about all those brothers? Oh, esos hermanos, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell My us. My brothers are kind of difficult, you know? They were difficult when I was a kid. They liked to like, I think their hobby was to make me cry, you know? Um, I was real chiona then and now. And you know, I was that girl, you know, that always cried in class, you know that girl? That was me. And um, 
I'm not the youngest. I'm in the middle. You know, I have two older and four younger. But I still, you know, even though I, I get all this love and readers and fans, you know, I get no respect. You know, I'm like the Rodney Dangerfield of my family, you know. <laughs> no respect for my brothers. You know, when I see them, they'll say, clean the refrigerator. <laughs> or something like that. I don't even live here and I got to clean your refrigerator. You know? Martina's father said, if you ever have a family secret, put it in a book of poetry. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I don't know. This is nonfiction, so I think you know their you know their photo is in the book. Maybe they'll crack it open. But even if they do, they'll they'll never tell me anything mm. like you're know, nice. You know. So, I don't know what's the matter with them. So tell us about your motivation and and the strength it took to leave that family of your brothers and your father and be the first you know, one out the I door. I had to leave. You know, I had to leave. My house was so noisy. I don't know about your house, but my mother would have like the radio on and my brothers had TVs on and there was no like carpeting on the stairs and my brother would stomp, 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 stomp up and down. And then you'd say, stop talking so loud. I'm not talking so loud, this is how I talk. You know, you're such a baby. You know, so they were always like, you know, just like, it just was too much. That's why I started staying up late at night and writing like when everybody was snoring from midnight to like two o'clock in the morning, my father would complain I was a vampire. But that was like, you know, I didn't have any privacy. So that little time was when I could, you know, read a book of poetry and sing and write, you know. But I just felt like I was living with a football team, so I had to get out, <laughs> had to get out of there, you know, and, the, and I just, like, even the neighborhood depressed me, like, if I went to visit and walked my dog, there was, like, a, no dirt to walk the dog, it was just broken glass and needles, and, you know, it was just very depressing, and I thought, you know, I can't stay here, I just got to get out. The worst thing that could happen to me, I thought, would be to fall in love with someone from Chicago, and I'd get married and get stuck here. That was like, you know, so my goal was always like, you know, I got to get out of here. And then when you first left, you actually lived in the basement of your brother's house. Well, I didn't want to live in the basement. My father made me do that. You know, I wanted to get out of my father's house so I could ride. And he said, como sola? No, no. So he had a building that he had bought and my brother rented, my brother was in medical school, my oldest brother, he was living with his wife on the second floor and there was a woman and a, her husband who was deaf who lived on the first floor and I, my father had that basement so he made me kind of as a compromise live in the, the basement and I was like, oh, okay. So I lived in the basement and uh, that was my, like, my, my big toe out the door. And then from there, I had a big blowout with my brother who uh, became a spy. You know, he would watch who was coming, who was going, <laughs> who spent the night. Well, you know, someone spent the night, but that didn't mean they shared my bed. Sure. So I was really angry at that. And so one day I got, I, know, I think I didn't have a car then. I got on my bicycle, really mad. And I, I bicycled to my old high school neighborhood, which is the neighborhood I wanted to live in, which is now all chic. But I, I, if I'd had money, I, I, I remember telling my parents, you need to buy a building in this neighborhood. It's going to go up, and nobody listened to me. Anyway, I moved in that neighborhood, and I found an apartment, and I just drove around. I was, you know, I was always looking for windows where there was tape, where someone was painting. I said, hmm, I'm going to live there. And that's how I found my apartment, and I just did it, you know, because I tried to meet my father's uh, needs, but it didn't meet mine. I was always having this choke. That's why I'm glad I'm not 20. But it's okay. It only lasts 10 years, you know, so, you know. <laughs> You know, your 20s are the worst because you're trying to please your father and your mother and the church and the state and the boyfriend and the girlfriend. You know, just, oh, just so awful. Right. Such an awful time. Yeah. You know, and it's finally like when you get to 30, you figure out, oh, my God, I wasted 10 years being a geisha. You know? <laughs> You know, so like, you know, and then it keeps, you keep relearning at 40, then your parents die and you realize, oh my God, I was trying to please my mother and father. And then you know, finally you get to the time when you're 60 and you turn invisible again. You know, it's like you're a kid again, you're, nobody notices you. And it's like someone put a knife away. It's kind of a relief, you know, I feel, I like it. And you know, you're just invisible again, which for a writer is perfect. You want to be invisible. You want to come in and not have everybody notice. You just come in, you sit, you notice so things, you and you don't care what anybody thinks anymore. You know, I don't know what it's like after 60, because I'm just 60, but so far, so good. <laughs> you know? I really like it. 
So, um, and if you're younger you, than 60, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> so let me ask you about another chapter that I really enjoyed reading was Guadalupe, the sex goddess. Yeah. So um, let's talk about some of that, the, um, the way sometimes sexuality in, in women, especially Latina women, is not something that's embraced. Well, you're not supposed to have any sexuality, you know? You're until just supposed you to be... married her until... No, you're just like married. neuter, you know? You're not supposed to acknowledge it, you know? Uh, so I, 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 I wasn't trying to offend you. People have to read that chapter to understand what I'm trying to say because I feel for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Guadalupana. I'm, I'm not Catholic, but I'm a Guadalupana. And I grew up playing on that little hill where the Virgen uh, Basilica is, that little mound of earth that was the shrine for Cuatlicue, a very important uh, territory in Mexico. I grew up, that was our neighborhood, and I never understood or uh, called myself a Guadalupana until later in my life. You know, she really helped me to connect with some of the uh, pre-conquest diosas and, and a female power that is different from uh, maybe any other feminism. It's a kind of feminism that maybe Gloria Anzaldúa writes about. I, I really had to discover those diosas and, the, and see the Virgen de Guadalupe as a, an energy and a power and a way for me to redefine myself by, by me, not by a church or state or father. And so for me, she's a, a wonderful uh, symbol of, of Latina feminism. That's how I see her. She might not be the same Guadalupe that maybe you know my grandmother prayed to, uh, but uh, she's part of a lineage of women coming into their own power, and I like that. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing that I think more young women should know about these female diosas, this goddess stuff. That yeah, really and, and also Greek mythology, like read Robert Gray's The White Goddess. Go back and look at uh, when the world was matriarchal. You know, and look at those goddesses and, and Celtic goddesses and all of the mythologies of, you know, especially for us, it's important to look at the Americas because the Americas gets ignored. And it's very important, I think, for us to do that research because we're not getting those books, you know. We, we're not getting those books in the schools. And we need to look at the interstices and the footnotes and dig them out and find them for ourselves. Yeah, we do. Which leads me to some of the social commentary that um, you've put in chapters and in essays that you've written. You, you, you mentioned the phrase, and I realize you didn't coin it, but los asustados unidos. Can you tell us what that means? Well, after 9-11, after 9-11, uh, a radio show in Mexico, someone, caller, uh, dubbed the United States los asustados Unidos, which translates as the United States of fear. And I think that's uh, uh, so precise for how we're living in post 9-11, uh, I wouldn't even say United States, post 9-11 world. We're in this, uh, uh, what I call, epoca de susto, really an era of fear. And uh, I, I, I feel it so viscerally when I cross the border and come back into the United States where we're uh, united globally by this fear and divided globally by this fear. It's a paradox. I, I feel like um, we we're, we're don't have anyone who's guided us or who has given us wisdom of how to um, find clarity in these times of susto, uh, except perhaps, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, who I, the Buddhist monk, who I always recommend everyone read. And, uh, and I never thought I would say this, but like the Pope, that new Pope, you know. Pope Francis. Yeah, Pope Francis, like real, like, he's got guts to say things. Everybody else is uh, asustado, you know. You know, the people are afraid. You know, we have uh, uh, people like Mr. Trump who's so afraid and, and fomenting the fear and allowing people to be fearful. So I, I call him a male impersonator, you know. <laughs> Because I, I think, like Cesar Chavez, real men uh, protect the weak. They protect the weak of society. That's what I think a real man should do. You know? yeah. 
So staying on that theme about social commentary and um, in the age of DAPA and DACA and the Dreamers, can you talk a little bit about what you see that movement around with Latino young people and how you see it develop and impacting this age of fear that we're living in? Well, you know, maybe it's the Dreamers and the people that are in the position that are most vulnerable that are going to be leading us. I feel. Um, I feel very decepcionada, very deceived by uh, where we are politically, and I don't. I, I'm in this state, and it's it's not a good state where I'm at right now. I feel, um, I feel deceived. I feel deceived by the political parties and the political system. Uh, I feel sad when I come to the United States because the immigrants and the poor and Mexicans have become like the new slaves of this millennia. We're the ones on the bottom. Things are worse than when I started voting 30 years ago. And I didn't expect that to be happening, that we're mas fregados in, in my lifetime. I've never seen such a horrible place that we're at. And I really don't know. I'm in that place of feeling uh, impotente. I've, I'm in that place, you know, maybe, uh, I've been there before, and I wrote House on Mongo Street from that state, and um, I don't know what's gonna be coming. Uh, I, I feel in Mexico, uh, you know, at least the people there are aware that everybody lies to them in the media. And, you know, they don't believe the media at all, like here. And uh, at least in Mexico, you know, they don't, they know that the government's corrupt. And there's a state of like uh, unity from grassroots, from the community. And uh, I don't, we haven't gotten to that place of unity. We're so divided in the United States. So I, I feel this great uh, sadness and fear when I, when I come across. I don't feel that sadness and fear in Mexico because people siquiera, they unite and organize. But uh, I don't see a unity here right now. I, I don't know what to say to young people because I know I'm supposed to give you hope. But I need to sit in some place and process what's going on. And the more I look at the media and the more I see the news, the more I walk around and watch the first family in the United States is the Kardashians. That's the first family. And that people are so absorbed on their cell phones and connecting with each social media instead of connecting with their hearts or spending time to meditate or connect with their spirits, that they're so busy talking to their little machines that they don't, can't hear the things inside their heart. It's so sad for me. Okay, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna get to the audience questions, but I have just one or two burning ones, and one is about your move from the United States to San Miguel de Allende. Can you just talk a little bit about how, what that transition's been like, and what it is like now being essentially an expatriate? Well, um, how come, somebody asked this, why are, when people move to Mexico, called expatriates instead of immigrants? You know, why, why is that? I don't know. I'm actually a double nationality. I have dual citizenship, so I feel really happy about that. But you know, I write about that in the last chapter. People know I'm not uh, um, Mexican from my accent when I speak Spanish. It's getting better, but I don't sound like a native. Uh, and also, I'm not treated like a tourist. Um, sometimes I'm not, uh, I talk about not getting a table because I get mistaken for a Mexican. And there's a lot of racism in Mexico against, uh, uh, you know, there's a hierarchy, especially in the town I live in. If you look like a tourist, uh, then you get a different service. If you're a local person, they, ha they can and, and might refuse you a table. And, and that happened to me. So the good news is I passed for Mexican. <laughs> the bad news is I didn't get a table, you know? So, you know, there's that. And uh, the more indigenous you look, uh, the worse you get treated in Mexico, you know, and if you dress indigenous, uh, people look at you like you're trash, you know, so there's this horrible sense of, of self-racism in Mexico, uh, so it's not all perfect. Um, I don't know why I was called to be there. I know I was called to be there by my ancestors or angels or UFO, I don't know. 
some, something. It wasn't me that put that idea in there. And uh, I, I have no idea why I was asked to be there. And I actually was afraid. I'm actually afraid. There's a lot of guns, but you know, the police have them. The, the citizens don't have them. The police have them. And you know, you can't go to the office depot without some guy with a machine gun standing at the door. And it's like, ah! And everybody's like, oh yeah, isn't it wonderful? This, we're safe. <laughs> you know, that, I just, yeah. it freaks me out. It freaks me out, and so I, it's not a perfect place, but uh, I feel uh, creative there. I feel connected to community there. I feel uh, happy. I feel that when, if I'm alone, I just have to go into the center of town, and something makes you laugh every day. There's, you know, hint there. I, people are so funny. You know, especially when they don't mean to be. You know, they just like walk by and they say something or you'll see something astonishing every day in San Miguel. And I, I like that, um, that I feel a very present moment there. I don't know that I'm going to be there the rest of my life. I thought I was going to be in San Antonio the rest of my life. But that's where I am called to be right now. And I know I have some spiritual work to do. And uh, I feel very excited because I feel like I was just born. Like everything in my life has been leading up for me to be there now. I, I'm the most afraid. I'm not brave. I'm not a brave person. Uh, I'm afraid of little terrors. You know, I, I can't be somewhere if a mouse comes out. You know, <laughs> I can't cross the street if a rat appears. Uh, rabbits scare me, you know. <laughs> Uh, fast cars, driving, heights, bridges. I'm afraid of so many things. Um, but for some reason, knowing that the antepasados opened the path and that my ancestors are taking care of me, uh, I feel fine. I feel like, you know, I hope I don't get abducted, but, you know, even if I did, maybe I could write a good story about that. You know? <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm there, but I'm supposed to be there. Well, and speaking of culture, I'll just, and my last question, then we'll get to these questions, I promise. Um, you also have a chapter in the book about the um, embroidery blouses. The huipiles. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about your fondness for these blouses and what they I, represent you? know, for you? Um, uh, the older I get, the more connected I am with my mother and her ancestors that were indigenous. And uh, I do know from my DNA uh, what tribe we're from, uh, but I can't tell you because it's going to be on the air at uh, Finding Your Roots and PBS next year. So I can't tell you. But, um, but you know, we knew that anyway. You know, just look in the mirror. You know, so it's like uh, we kind of knew it. It's kind of nice to know now. And I have always felt um, happy when I'm wearing Mexican uh, in clothing. And I feel happiest when, you know, I always try to wear something. Uh, lo que sea from uh, that, that I, people would know that I come from the Americas. To me, it's like my bandera. It's my flag. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay, let me get to some of these questions. A lot of them are really advice for young people, for writers, um, for how to motivate to write. Uh, what's your advice for My a young... My advice is that you should all write as if what you have to say cannot be published in this lifetime. And uh, actually, write it with the intent not to share it. If you don't have any privacy, I told you, you could tear it up. It's not important that you keep it, it's important that you write it. That you take it out of your heart. And you write about the things that um, you're not allowed to speak about, that you're afraid to think about. Write about those things and then tear it up. Uh, that's, that's a good way. If you insist on uh, sharing your writing, um, there's two rules, tell the truth and do no harm. And by that, you tell the truth, but if anyone is in the writing that you might hurt, you either destroy it, you change the name, you change the gender, you change the town so they can't recognize themselves because there's already enough violence and evil in the world, you don't have to add your two cents, you know. That's great advice. And what advice do you give to girls whose, whose dad uh, doesn't want them to leave the college, especially if they're the only girl? Uh, well, you should tell them that I did it and that, uh, you know, it worked for me. <laughs> 
You should tell them that you have to, well, I told my father that I had to go to a school far away from home. I didn't go for undergraduate, but I did for graduate because that's where the program was that I wanted to go. And if you can, get someone from the faculty or some counselor to speak on your behalf. That always helps because parents, Mexican parents, Latino parents, have a big respect for uh, people in the academy, Maestro, teachers, professors. professionals. Yeah, get somebody to speak on your behalf. And there's a few questions too. We, we spoke a lot about Mango Street, but about the fact that the house on Mango Street was a banned book and still remains a banned book. Just questions oh, about? Uh, that's very good advertising for a book, you know, when it gets banned. <laughs> so you can't buy that kind of TV time, you know. I'm honored. And, but you know, look what gets banned in these times. You know, we're banned in these times. We can't even think anything without thinking, oh my God, what are they going to say? Oh, that's unpatriotic. You can't think that. So we're like, you know, this is a, such a conservative time. So I think every, you know, one of the things I like is like, you notice like poets, poets always get in trouble by uh, politicians. Like they never get invited to the White House during a war. Why? Because poets tell the truth. So if you know, a good place to start is to write poetry. That's a one place where you could say anything you want, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and there, some folks are curious, what is it, I guess they can't even realize, and it's hard to realize, what is it about the book that people find so objection objectionable? Why is it a banned book? I don't think they read it, so they don't think I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I did write a letter inside uh, one of the chapters of the book that I wrote to a woman who complained about the book. And she was very good about listening to me because I wrote her a letter that started out angry and I wrote it for seven days until I wrote a respectful and, and a letter that she would listen to. And I imagined I was writing it to my father and I kept rewriting it and rewriting with a lot of love and a lot of respect. And she did respond and uh, understood. So uh, that, that's a good exercise, you know, to write someone uh, a letter that you're angry with, but we keep writing it over and over until it's written with love and respect. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And here's another one from the audience. What do you think about the candidate Donald Trump? Oh, I already told, said that. I already had male impersonator. I already said that. All yeah. right, good. Pobrecito. Okay. Pobrecito. Pobrecito. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a number of invitations from different high schools. I know we have a high school in Salinas here. There's a high school in Novato High School, Novato High School. Okay. So what words of motivation would you share with children who are growing up in a multicultural nation? Well, I think this is an incredible time. You have an incredible responsibility in these times when communities are afraid of each other and divided. I would recommend that if you're uh, monolingual, get with the program, become multilingual, bilingual, so last century. So you need to get multilingual, because you're going to have to compete for jobs with the globe. So two languages isn't going to cut it. Move on up. And, you know, I would say to you are each, all of you who are mixed race are our ambassadors for the new millennium. You are ambassadors because you understand all these different cultures that don't understand each other. So you are potential bridge. Think of yourself as a bridge, not a wall, okay? And there's a question about your collection of short stories, Women Hollering Creek, they're wondering, are you going to write another collection of short stories? Yes, uh, I have one called um, uh, Seven Tales is the subtitle. I think it's called, still called Infinito. And um, they're uh, tales of people in history. I don't want to write biographies. I love to read biographies, but I don't want to spend my life writing one biography. So I want to do these seven tales. Uh, one story has already been written, and I want to write about Maria Sabinas and the Weolin, the Rosa Covarrubias, Maria Callas, you know, some people that get lost in the history, uh, in the footnotes of history that I, I'd like to illuminate younger people to about their lives. So I want to write uh, short stories about them for a forthcoming book. I also have a, you know, a novel that's kind of very small, little bat 
fluttering in my head right now, wants to be a, a novel in the future. I call it a novella so that I won't be frightened. <laughs> and then I have an experimental short story I want to do in a kind of cross-pollinized, pollinized? Is that the word? Uh, um, um, uh, genre. I like to cross genres and I don't want to talk about that one too much because then if you talk about it, it, it flies away. And uh, I want to do the new essays on my loves and uh, uh, mentors. And uh, oh, I just always have so many ideas, you know. I just, I just need to stay home. You know? <laughs> well, speaking of uh, writers and writing, tell us a little bit about some of the Latina writers that you've been keeping an eye out for and who oh, you're watching well, for. Well, see, I knew I should have brought my little shopping bag because uh, I was uh, Carla Trujillo. Yeah, I wrote some down. Uh, Faith and Fast. Faith and Fat Chance, uh, Carlos Trujillo's new book. Uh, I like Cristina Granados, mm -hmm. and she has Saints and Sinners from El Chuco, really good book. And uh, uh, I like uh, Reina Grandes, The Distance Between Us. And uh, I like um, Denise Chavez, The King and Queen of Comezon. And I love Elena Maria Viramontes' work. Uh, there's just a lot of... And, Newer writers, poets, Laurie and Guerrero. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, especially in Texas, it seems like there's a, a lot of younger writers coming up. Maybe because I live there so that I see their books coming up. Uh, unfortunately, there a lot of them coming out with little small presses and they don't have a, a big company distributing them. So I mentioned them on my favorites page on my website. Yeah, you mentioned also Daisy Hernandez, A Cup of Water Under My Bed. Yes, that's right. And the yeah. poet Loriana, Lorian Guerrero. Lorian Guerrero from yeah. San Antonio, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little bit about your Macondo Foundation and how you mentor. Oh, I don't writers. work with Macondo anymore. I founded oh. it um, a long time ago uh, after I was teaching here in Berkeley and I didn't like going to class and I was the teacher, you know. <laughs> And I said, well, that's not good. That's not good. Why don't you like going to class? I said, I, I don't like my students. <laughs> I said, why don't you like your students? They just care about their GPA. I said, well, that's not good. You know, you, you, one day you can teach your own class and you can invite the students. And that's what I did. I started a class in my uh, kitchen dining room and I invited only students who uh, serve their community, who do uh, community activism, uh, writers who feel their writing can change the world. And that's how Macondo was born. It still exists. I'm no longer a part of it. Uh, writers who, are, uh, who have a book or who are, have the, a manuscript could apply. You can go to the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center a website in San Antonio and ask Lorian Guerrero, who's the director of the Macondo Workshop about information. Excellent. Okay. And is there a time check here? One more? Last, yeah. last question. Yeah. Last question. Oh my God, the last question. Um, okay. I don't know if you can answer this shortly, but um, you have some poems, one last poem for Richard and Never Marry a Mexican that are so beautiful. Are these stories based on real men? Have your personal uh, experience uh, One last them? poem for Richard was based on uh, Richard. I'll write about Richard in the, new, in the next collection. And uh, Never Marry Mexican is a short story. And it was, uh, it's, it's auto, all the, you know, I have to explain that when I write fiction, I take autobiographical emotions. And I wanted to write a modern day Malinche story from the emotions of some place in my own heart. So uh, some parts of it, some, the emotions are true. And the characters, as you know, I tried to think, how does the Malinche enter into us now in our current, not the historical figure, but how are we affected by Malinche in our relationships with men today? So um, yes and no, you know, yes, it's based on some emotion that's mine and that character will be explored in the uh, next collection of, it, of essays. That's, that's great. We're going to look forward to your next collection. Her yeah. book is A House of My Own, Stories from My Life. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra Thank Cisneros. You. That's been lovely.
could see this.